Like when you look at that language, we don't even know what it sounds like, right? right. Okay, let's tell you. <laughs> we do know what it sounds like. Well, we do anyway. This is one of the scripts of the spoken language known as Nuwapik or Misbatia. Mm. And Kunai form or Kuni form is just one of those scripts. And so is what people call hieroglyphics or what we call the Safuf. Well, we're about greetings. We're about to watch the Joe Rogan experience. experience um, yeah. He's interviewing um, Bill Carson. So this will be an interesting topic. Um, we're going to discuss further. Yeah, let's, let's, wa let's watch and see what, yeah. what he has to say. I was able to take stone tablets and decipher them myself. So anyone can go online to the UCLA CDLI online cuneiform digital library and, and read these stone tablets for themselves. You don't need Zachariah Sitchin, you don't need anyone else. And as I began to break these tablets down... Do they have them transcribed or are you reading the actual tablet? You can, they, you, they transcribe them. They actually transcribe so them into English. <laughs> so, you're, you're, so, so you're still held by ransom to <laughs> whatever they... Just like the Bible translating yeah. it into English, like you just said, little g, big g, when we know there's no little g, big g's in Hebrew. So when you're getting a transliteration or transcribed text then again how do you verify that yeah, you're what? taking their word for it, for it yeah but yeah. let's let's keep listening yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. controversy <laughs> as far as like are there different versions of the transcription like do some people think it, it, it's interpreted differently is like some debate about that only where it comes to where some of the text is missing there could be oh, pieces okay. chipped off of tablets right. you see that corner missing from that tablet right there in the epic yeah. of just look how how wild is that yeah just it's how incredible. wild is that 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 exists yeah. and that this was it's so hard for people to put in their brain 5,000 years of time yeah. and that there's these people that have this very bizarre language. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. when you look at that language, we don't even know what it sounds like, right? right? Okay, let's tell you. We do know what it sounds like. Well, we do anyway because the master go back 30, 40 years ago and look, look at the little scrolls, mythology, um, you know, what's God's first language? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These tablets were published and put in there from a long time ago. When he says we don't know what it sounds like, we do because Panda Babyanun, Dr. Malachi Ziyuk has explained that this is one of the scripts of the spoken language known as Nuwapik or Misbatia. Mm. Just like the hieroglyphics is also one of the scripts. So yes, the spoken language a lot of people didn't know, mm. but it's actually Nawapik or Misbatia yeah. and Kunai form or Kuni form is just one of those scripts and so is what people call hieroglyphics or what we call the, um, the Safuf. But yeah, let's keep listening. Interesting. Which popped up out of nowhere. You know, you're talking about a civilization that appeared out of nothing. It looks like computer code. Mm -hmm. It does. Doesn't it? Yes, it does. I just imagine like a, a human being deciding that they were going to write down in these very bizarre and they all agreed that all these things mean a certain thing so they had to somehow or another have a rosetta stone or something where they're documenting it so that yeah. people can learn it and teach it and then we're looking at it five thousand years later yeah it's so amazing it is and what's incredible is this text was translated in the 1800s long before zachariah sitchin was born so there are some you know uh, some rumors that oh he was the only one that could decipher these tablets well no uh, George Smith, uh, who worked as an Assyriologist and wrote many books and de deciphered these Sumerian tablets in the 1800s. So we're talking about texts that have been deciphered for a few hundred years, nothing that was just deciphered recently. So when, the, what are the first deciphering? Like mm -hmm. what year was the first deciphering? It was in 1800, I don't have to, I think around 1850, uh, George Smith. Uh, he actually worked uh, at, uh, at, at the, uh, I believe it was Cambridge. And what was his take? Like, what did, when, when he's reading all these wacky stories and the, all the Anunnaki stuff, like, yeah. what's his take on it? He is literally subscribing to this information the way almost that you and I see it today. These people saw something, experienced something, interacted with something, um, and he cataloged it, and it inspired him to write uh, a, a complete tr um, translation of the Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation. And he talks about the fact that that information was copied right from those tablets and put to the, the Old Testament Bible. of yep. the Bible. Mm. And so, you know, not, not exactly like it's going to go from here to the Bible, but it went to other ancient uh, papyruses and scriptures and, uh, and so forth. And then later on, when, when it was discovered in caves, people took those and then said, okay, we got to put this into a book. And then it became the Bible much later, mm. around 100 AD. But, but he subscribed to the theory that these people interacted with beings in some way, shape, or form, and that also 
uh, this information is so incredible that it became part of the, uh, the uh, you know, the, uh, the biblical text. Did you ever read the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yes, yeah. Qumran so tablet. Mm. Found in, in, when, what year was that? It was in Qumran, right? They found it in Qumran, these... but I think, again, this was, um, this was also, I believe, in the late 1800s or early 1900s. Is when they found yeah. them? So these things are written on animal skins, and this is the only, I mean, this is a, a very old version of those exact same stories, or some of similar stories. Yeah. There's a lot of weirdness in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like, yeah. I, I haven't read it, but is there any references? <laughs> in, I ain't talking to him. Man, I ain't read it. I've always read it. The way he's talking, <laughs> like, he's read it. They show up everywhere, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the New English, and the Epic of Atrocities. Uh, of course, even in the Bible, they're known as the Anak, A-N-A-K. We were grasshoppers in the The Anakites. Na na the yeah. Anakites. Uh, yeah. So no matter where you go in, in, in any culture, you're going to discover that these beings, in some way, shape, or form, engaged mankind, uh, brought knowledge, teaching, uh, building techniques, um, and, and just so much more wisdom and information, esoteric wisdom, uh, alchemy, all these things came from these people. So the, the craziest version of this story is that they genetically engineered us out of lower primates and put us here to mine gold. Mm -hmm. There's the us again. Established isn't it? <laughs> different types of civilizations and taught us how to build things, taught us all these different things. And enough time has passed that we've kind of forgot. Mm -hmm. Enough time has passed. That's the wackiest right, version of it, right? Right, right. That's the bare bones minimum. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the wackiest versions that they, they made us, mm -hmm. which is, we always, we've talked about this a couple of times, but how bizarre it is that human beings have this incredible fascination for gold. Mm -hmm. We're fascinated with gold. Yeah. This fascination with gold is really weird. Mm -hmm. Like why back when it was basically useless, you couldn't make a knife out of it, right. you couldn't, <laughs> you know, like it didn't make sense that this would be so valuable. Just yeah. because it's rare, you're barely alive. You know, right. you, we're going, you know, right? We're going back to full on hunter and gather yeah. our ancestors with spears and, and stone chip. Th and then after that, gold emerges mm -hmm. and it stays, yeah. it stays forever. Yeah. Now, when you read Zachariah Sitchin's book, he talks about this in the 1970s. His description of it was that they needed to suspend gold particles in the atmosphere mm -hmm. because their atmosphere is being destroyed right then you move to like somewhere around the 2000s when climate scientists start proposing this idea mm -hmm. of suspending reflected particles in the atmosphere right and then when you realize the unique properties of gold how unusual it is in terms of like a building material you can coat things mm -hmm. the reason why things are like coated in gold silver plated gold plated rather you can take a tiny piece of gold and cover an enormous area with it. It's yeah. a strange metal, yeah. like really weird. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, the supposed story is, it's very common on Earth, very rare on Nibiru. Right. Yeah, that's the story. And then when, when I, I started looking into this gold thing myself, and here's what I came up with. So when you start analyzing the text, you discover that there was a camp, an encampment in a place called South Africa at Adam's Calendar. Okay. Now, Adam's calendar, there's actually the very first gold mines discovered. They're dating them back to about 200,000 years ago. And yeah. that's incredible because there's a building there that looks like a worn down structure. Now, in the tablets, it talks about the fact that the Ijiji, who were the working class Anunnaki huh? beings who were cleaning out the Gigi. Yeah, the, the Gigi. Gigi. Those the are the rocket ship. Yeah. <laughs> and it's also uh, the, what he's talking about is in the holy tablets where the master is explaining that. You know, because gold can be made as thin as paper, mm -hmm. and they needed that to deal with the ozone so, layer that was depleting, isn't yeah. it? So that's what they're talking about. But they, yeah, they gigi, you know, they gigi, they <laughs> they stayed up uh, above. But let's keep listening. Euphrates and Tigris River, uh, so they can create irrigation and you know create a bustling civilization. Also, what they were doing the actual construction themselves. No people needed, just them working. They were like the construction workers, and Anu and, and Enkian and Lil, these leader gods, were like, you know, the foremen, the, you know, the art master <laughs> architects and so forth, right, the boss. So these people were working, but they weren't supposed to be enslaved. They were volunteers. They got tired of doing the work, according to them, for about 250,000 years of labor on Earth, and also, according to them, on Mars. This is in the text. They call it Lamu. And so La they decided to do more against yeah. Enki and Lil and Anu, <laughs> because their demands had not been met. So they went to meet them in the Epic of Atrahasis. They go to 
Adam's calendar, they go to that same structure that was discovered where that gold mine is located. I was like, holy crap, there is some link here to gold. Specifically, exactly, I don't know, but I know if you're in advanced civilization, you need gold. And the people that you have working it for, you probably think, you know, it's, it's to adorn or to adorn yourself or in recognition of the gods. So they'll wear it and they'll utilize it, but not for technology. Um, but what's crazy is they go to war, they go to get ready to go to battle. And then Enki says, I have an idea that will stop this war. There's an existing being on this planet, existing, not something that doesn't exist, existing. We this is the conflict of the gods, isn't it? Mm. With Enki and Enlil um, fighting because um, en Enlil, as we've explained in a previous video, was meant to stay up in the skies, be yeah. the father of the skies. And Enki was mm. rule of the key or the, yeah. or the planet. And he was over the, the mining of the gold project. And um, then, yeah, they, the two of them were at war. And then his, um, Enlil went back to report to Anu, their mm. father, that Enki wasn't doing the work because the, the beings were finding it very difficult to mine the gold because of the atmosphere mm. was different. And then they went about, Enki proposed cloning a Lulu Amilu to, yeah. to do the work. Yeah. yeah, so let's see how. But there's yeah. a film as well, um, John Travolta made, um, boy, he, he, he starred in it called Battlefield Earth. Yeah. Where these group of beings come down, yeah, created these. Well, they used the the the. They were kind of like caveman type, and they used them to mine the gold. Okay. Battlefield Earth. So yeah, look on that. Okay. On, for that one. Right, let's keep going. We had our essence to it with a slain god. So they're talking about taking the DNA of genetics from some, one of themselves That's, and um, mixing it with the DNA of the hominid that was here. It's not specified whether it was, was it you know, true or man or anything. Mm. They don't specify in the tablets, but to Guess create you, that's a it. worker being. Mm. And the Lulu Amilu. Yeah. Modification, right. Right? Disconnecting some of our DNA, making genetic modification to us to get us to take orders from them. They inserted something called a worship gene, which was just discovered recently, that human beings have a gene inside of them that can be turned on and turned off. It can be turned off in a laboratory setting. It can also be turned off with a magnetic field around your head. And when it's off, you don't want to worship anything outside of yourself. You look inside, and when it's on, you look to get something from the outside. So this is incredible. Uh, and so, so they, 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 they just worship the gene yes. inside of us yeah. to make us worship them. Wow, right. genius. That's incredible, because then you're not a slave anymore. You're doing this for the honor of the gods. And for people don't, who think this is all this talk is really crazy, I want to put into perspective that we talked about this the other day, that during the, was it, which war was it, where the Soviet Union was experimenting? Was it, it was scientists in the Soviet Union, correct? They're experimenting with creating a chimpanzee-human being hybrid that they would probably send to war. Yeah. So instead of having regular people, we would make this monster, yeah. this, this freak, you know, ape man, and send him to war and have him crush the enemies. Yeah. Like, <laughs> just, how crazy is that? They knew how strong chips are. I got an idea. Let's yeah. turn a chimp human, and that way, if he dies, who gives a fuck? Right. We made him. <laughs> oh, and God. Him. God. <laughs> and if you a supremely enlightened being, wouldn't you think of human beings with all of our folly and all of our chaos and all of our war and bullshit and the internet and disinformation and misinformation, wouldn't you think of us kind of the same way we would think about that chimp hybrid thing? Yeah. If yeah. I was a you know, I'm the president of Russia. I yeah. want, well, I want my cousins to go to war, <laughs> no. or I want to send this freak exactly. that I made in a lab. Yeah, and what's interesting, I'm, sure, I'm glad you said made in a lab. They had talked briefly in that text about fashioning people. In other words, almost How did like they, say it? they said the word fashioning. So that's the lab in Shimti, isn't Shimti, it? The yeah, laboratory, yeah, yeah. because what they don't mention is the rest of the family, like Arishkigal and Nagal yeah, and yeah. Nusku and all these other Ninti, guys, yeah. Ninti that were part of the experiment. And Ninti, Ninti was one of the ones that actually volunteered. Mm. So that's in um, birth ceremony from the master teacher from what, 30 years ago. Tablets. Ta holy tablets. Okay, let's but keep actually, going. What was the, do you, can, do you remember the actual quote? Um, I, gotta, I would have to look it up, the actual, the actual quote. But, but they, they describe it as fashion. Fashion, because they said even the lamb hadn't been fashioned yet, so they had fashioned lambs. So, they fashioned, and it's also an epic of Gilgamesh, they fashioned uh, the friend that Gilgamesh went on the journey with. He wasn't born from a woman's womb. They oh, speaking of Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Enkidu. Yeah, that's right. En Enkidu, Enkidu, yeah. That's Gilgamesh's, yeah, his yeah, brethren. his brethren that went on it with us. Enkidu, yeah, that's what he's trying to say, yeah. The epic of 
Gilgamesh. So they, you, you, they used that phrase several times in the tablets. But they said, no, wait. So it was almost like that's not a good idea because it, it, in some ways it seems as if they had known that the idea of making these artificial, too many artificially created people wouldn't be a good idea. Now, they didn't go deeper than that, but you can see where we are today with AI and everything else and these, you know, these robots that are coming. Maybe they knew something about that. But they decided to take an, a, a biological being and genetically modify and program that to do the work, and that's exactly what they did. Well, if they really knew what we would be capable of, and that we would be illogical. Overpopulation would be a gigantic issue. Mm -hmm. And in many parts, I mean, it's not really that big of an issue here, except for in cities, but in many parts of the world, it's the whole country. Yeah. The whole country is New York City, which right. is just fucking bonkers. Yeah. You know, and you got to wonder, that's actually not true. It's like, it's not even that bad, even in China. China has a lot of open space. But when you're in those cities, they are massive. Mm -hmm. And they are filled with people. Yeah. And that is probably what you'd imagine a higher being would do if it was like us, like kind of illogical mm -hmm. and kind of a little bit reckless and yeah. has a little bit too much technology for the average person that mm -hmm. didn't develop the technology. But all of a sudden you got some 85 IQ dope yeah. who has access <laughs> to all the things that all these geniuses have created. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could, I mean, you could figure, we talked to Michio Kaku, he built a nuclear reactor in his house. Right. When he was a kid. <laughs> I heard about that. That was <laughs> crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, I know. That's so crazy. But there's a lot of different stuff that you can do and have access to technology that is beyond anything you would ever be able to invent with your own mind. Mm -hmm. But because we share things across the board, we're, you would imagine that if you were an enlightened being from another planet that's a million years more advanced than us, you'd go... <sighs> I see where this one's going. <laughs> you know, like, you have that cousin who's an alcoholic and then he wins the lottery, like, oh, shit, Derek just won the lottery. Yeah. Fuck! <laughs> this is going to be crazy. Yeah. Derek's got $200 million. Right. It's going to be fucking insane. It's crazy. And they knew they were, they were going outside their own guidelines and their own laws, their parameters, because they made a, a statement in the text. They said the creator of all was going to punish them or they would have to answer to the creator of all for what they did here. So and that, that lets you know they weren't really gods. They knew themselves that they weren't the creator of the universe, but that they um, they masqueraded as gods on this planet. Just like we did when, you know, when different versions of human civilization would find primitive tribes, you know, like the cargo tribe. Cargo tribes, cults. The cargo cult that you talked about in your documentary. Yeah. That is so fascinating yeah. that during World War II, planes landed on these remote places, yeah. and these people built mock planes <laughs> yeah. to show like what the thing was that right. came to visit them that they thought were like gods. Wild. Do you yeah. think that if the Anunnaki are real, and if, if Nibiru really exists, and there's another planet with highly intelligent beings that are far more advanced than us, if that's the case, do you think there's more advanced and more advanced and more just like mm. we are to chimpanzees they are to us yeah. and then another race is to them and then it just keeps going on and on forever until you're god absolutely i believe there's a, there's levels to the game just like there's levels in terms of how we live on this planet yeah you know, we have the first world second world third world just here on earth now magnify that on, as a fractal as a universe as a whole you have civilizations that are a million, two million, maybe even a billion years ahead. Oh, and every uh -huh. universe, progress, every, every, I'm talking about every civilization progressing within the universe at a specific rate. So you can have beings that have already maybe even shed the corporeal bodies and only exist as beings of energetic light. What does that sound like? It sounds like Ethereans yeah, to me, Ethereum man. beings, <laughs> pure energy, like we've been explaining this. Yeah, because once you transcend the physical, you don't need the skin mm. suit. Yeah. This is a pure energy being and the nine ether beings, this is what we're talking about. So, yeah, Bill, Bill has just said it. Let's you see. have everything mm. all the way back down towards us. And the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, he actually says oh. that he en has Emerald the Tablets of Thoth. <laughs> Who's Thoth? Tahuti Zahuti. There you go. And we've been, mm -hmm. we're telling everyone he's here, he's the oh. incarnation. Dr. Malachi Zio, Panda Babylon, um, the most prolific writer. No coincidence that who they're calling Thoth, Tahuti, was that scribe with the beacon, mm. the beak in ancient Egypt. You see him always writing. He's the one that wrote the emerald tablets and all the information that pretty much the planet, uh, on the planet, you know, so. And, and up to this day, there's no one writing this amount of information. information. That's right. To this real, day. real talk. Okay, let's keep going.
ability to incarnate at will on and in the plane he desires. He claims to be able to incarnate whenever he wants and even into other no. dimensions. Mm -hmm. so, so, so why is it that when we're telling you that he has incarnated now in the personage of Dr. Malachi, the least you could do is check it out, mm -hmm. right? Test yeah, him. Yeah. Let's see what you're saying. Are you yes. really who you say you are? But okay. Let's it an angelic, angelic descendants as well. On, yep, go on YouTube, re yep. listen to angelic descendants on earth. Um, listen to who and what you are. Do yeah, they, these are recordings. Do angels come in human form? Do something? angels come in human form? Yeah, there. these are the, the, the um, recordings from many years mm. ago when he was taking us through the school of Islam and explaining that these angels and gods that we're talking about in the bible are extraterrestrials right. that have come here um he gave us the whole anunnaki story so it's interesting let's keep listening that's next level yeah that's next but level. it does make sense that if we're capable of doing what we're doing we we're talking about your phone the samsung mm -hmm. galaxy x24 right. ultra with zooms and all this <laughs> different shit that's magic yeah. to someone just 200 years ago and if we keep, if it keeps going, mm -hmm. and you keep like playing this out as far as possible, it kind of makes sense. There would be levels to the kind of intelligent life that exists in the universe beyond our comprehension. Yeah. Would you have you talked to Terence Howard? Do you know his theory about how planets are created? Mm -hmm. That it's just things ejecting from the sun over billions and billions of years, and that there's a Goldilocks zone where you can create life. Right. And that's where the people are. Yeah. And then as this Goldilocks zone gets spread, you have to be super technologically proficient right. in order to control your environment to the extent that you no longer require the sun mm -hmm. in order to keep you alive. That kind of makes sense if yeah. the Bureau is out there past Pluto. Oh, it makes a lot of sense. It, it makes sense that they... Howard because I just talked to him a couple hours ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, so I used to, we were talking about that weight conjugations and everything. Fucked yeah. me up for like three days. <laughs> 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 I left this podcast for three days. I was like, yeah, damn. First of all, how the fuck is he so smart? Like, how would you ever imagine that a dude who's an actor on a television show or, right. or in a movie is that yeah. smart? Right, like, right. Like, freaky smart. Right. But, but the, his theory about the creation of planets, I was like, oh, that makes sense. Oh, it makes a lot we of sense. We watch stuff fly off the sun all the time. Mm -hmm. And if that this matter over time yeah. would coalesce mm -hmm. and become a planet. Yeah, it creates an accretion disk. And uh, everything in space creates accretion disks. So once that matter... What is that word? Accretion disk? Accretion, yeah. What does that mean? Disc. So once you have a certain amount of mass in space... Yeah, for Benici. Mm -hmm. On yeah, its own, stuff. wants to create this circular... Like the shape of our Milky Way galaxy. wants to start swir circling and swerving around itself. And then as it does that, it creates... It begins to create friction. As that, cr that friction increases, the, the, the matter begins to collapse in towards each other, all right, based on its own energy. And then it then forms a ball. And that then builds and attracts more mass until it builds into a moon or a planet or whatever. Yeah. What do you do when you encounter flat earth people? Oh man, I just I just try to be quiet. I just tell them, look, it's not my thing. You know, I remember flat earth society <laughs> offered me money years and years ago. Um, yeah, and I was like, no, I don't believe the earth is flat. I'm not getting involved with this. And I they do. really attacked me hard. Death yeah. threats and everything else. They get very upset. Yeah. I do not understand. I just think it's people committing to an idea. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. Well, it's a religion now. They turned it into a religion. Anytime that people can attack you so brutally over that, I mean, you, you're talk, I'm on live talking about quantum physics and they're in the chat. The earth is flat. The earth is flat. I mean, so that's, <laughs> that's like, I mean, one guy. I'm one, fascinated by it because it's the interesting. Thing, yeah, because it's the ultimate conspiracy theory. Yeah. The ultimate conspiracy leave it theory there. is that carry. we are all on a set and that the, world, the the Earth is flat, it's a disk, there's a wall, the government's aware of it, they the, won't let you pass a certain distance. Walls. Yeah, mm. there's ice walls. Yeah. Mm. And that space is just lights in the sky. Right, that's it. And the, the sun is a, is a ball <laughs> and, uh, and all this kind <laughs> of stuff. It's, it's wild. An, and it's attached to yeah. a, a version of Christianity, which is very interesting. It is, it's tied into Christianity. The 6,000 year old theme, the earth mm -hmm. is only 6,000 year old. The reason why people think the earth is 6,000 years old is because most of the tablets are 6,000 years old. And the Bible was written from the information that came from tablets. So that. Well, we said it in our very first video about earth is not flat. Yeah. And everyone's commenting and saying we, we're crazy. You've heard it now from, from, from other sources. And the 6,000 year that we've been mentioning, it keeps coming up. Birth of the Adamites. Birth of the Adamites 6,000 years ago. That's it. All right, let's keep going. As far back as anybody's quote-unquote knowledge seems to extend, 
that's where the 6,000 year old theory comes from. But they've taken that thing and turned it into a religion. I remember one guy DM me and he was going off and telling me he was going to shoot me in the head and all this stuff. <laughs> and I said, let me ask you a question. If there's no atmosphere, then what are you breathing right now? He goes, what do you mean? Well, I'm, bre I'm, breathing, I'm breathing oxygen. I said, well, that's a gas. Gas doesn't exist. I said, well, then you should be dead then because you're breathing a gas. And what else do you, are, are you inhaling when you breathe? He goes, oxygen. I said, well, no, you're breathing in, you know, helium, krypton, you know, mostly all nitrogen. Other, yeah, nitrogen. I said, you're breathing in all these other gases. Oxygen is only about 21% of that. Otherwise, you'd be dead. You know, yeah. so That's right. He didn't know. He couldn't say, I said, did you graduate from high school? He said, no. I said, I stopped talking. That's when I realized, don't waste your energy on these people. Well, there's a lot of dudes, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, flat earthers. Get a life. Very charismatic <laughs> people talk yeah. that don't know what they're talking about, which I do all the time. But they, but they, <laughs> they do it the way where they pretend they know something is true that's not true. Yeah, yeah. And people get sucked into it. I know. And I just don't understand why you would think that Earth is the only one out of all these things that we've observed that's flat. Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense. And I think this is respectfully to all these people that believe that. I think it's a giant waste of time. It is. I think concentrating <laughs> on the shape of the earth. We don't need to say any more. Even if it was flat, who fucking cares? <laughs> Look at what's going on out there. It would be kind of crazy if it was flat. That would kind of like bolster the idea that we're the shit. Right. And that we're, we're just so much more powerful and yeah, advanced unique. and special than everything else in the universe because we're the only ones that exist on a flat plane. Right. But the whole thing is just so insane. Yeah. Just what we know about the physical universe itself and well, about atoms and just just what we know about all the matter that exists in our lives is right. insane yeah it's insane i mean you know, obviously they haven't they haven't tapped into even forget quantum they standard physics they don't they don't comp, they don't comprehend it uh, and so because of that you know they're lost i mean satellites don't exist obviously to them so but that's remember, a kooky one i remember yeah. Yeah. Satellites maria, don't exist but they use system. mobile phones mm. watch them <laughs> you, i mean it's crazy hurricane maria comes and destroys uh, the, the caribbean and I, I unfortunately i had some loved ones that were involved in that and i posted a picture of the hurricane because i was raising money for hurricane supplies and they were commenting and attacking that's a fake image it doesn't exist i'm like <laughs> how much but how, let me ask you this how much of that is bullshit like how much of that is government either entities from other foreign governments where they they jump into these subjects oh, to yeah. make people seem really stupid, yeah. and when people say something really stupid, if they have one of the things they like to do is put a foreign flag, like mm -hmm. American flag rather, in mm -hmm. their in their little yeah yeah their profile, they have that. yeah, and they're just saying that dumb as shit, yeah. Yeah. and I'm going, I don't know if this is a real person. I think it's not. I think it's one of those person, one of those oh. things that's designed to muddy up any discourse about anything. Yes, yeah, a psyop. AI, like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, psyop. A long time ago, this whole flat Earth thing was a CIA psyop. I they think it was drop it in there. If it wasn't a CIA psyop, it was someone yeah. from 4chan who just wanted to be silly yeah. and went so hard with <laughs> explanations that a lot of gullible people without science degrees like me, um, <laughs> <laughs> they, fucking, they went along with it. And it's just one of those things where it's just, man, what a giant waste of time. It is. It's a waste of energy. And there's so much more we can learn like these ancient texts. And people say, why are you always focused on the ancient past? Well, because the past is prologue. If we don't understand what happened back then, we're doomed to continue to repeat mm. these cycles of time that we've been mm -hmm. in for quite some time, for eons. Yeah, I mean, it's you know? just direct evidence that civilizations don't last when they go kooky. Yes. You know, and that things go sideways, and there's natural disasters and wars that reshape landscapes. Like, look, mm -hmm. it's all there, and it's happening right now. Yeah. And if we're not aware of it, it'll happen to us, mm -hmm. and then we'll be a footnote of history. We'll be one of those things. There was this amazing country called America. Mm -hmm. They got crazy. They created all this art and culture, and they they did amazing things. But they went fucking sideways. Yeah. They sold out the money. They got involved in wars, and and then the next thing you know, mm -hmm. the world is operating essentially like communist China. The whole yeah. world. Yeah. But that's possible too, kids. Yeah. All right. You gotta be. You gotta fight for this because yeah. whatever this thing is that we have, this is like super fucking unique. But if you don't want to look at the past. You, if you're not fascinated by ancient structures, if you're not fascinated by what kind of technology and knowledge that they have yeah. 4,500 plus years ago to make the pyramids, right. who are these people? Exactly. What were they doing? Yeah. How did they do that? And what was that thing? Was that a power plant? Right. I mean, if you, I know you know that oh, theory. Yeah. That Absolutely. is a yeah. crazy theory that yeah. sounds so, it sounds completely wackadoo. Mm -hmm. But then when you have it laid out to you, uh, Christopher, what's his last name? Dunn. Christopher Dunn. I just had Dunn. him on my podcast a few weeks ago. I just had him a couple weeks ago, too. Yeah. I just had a uh, brain fart. The, yeah. it, his d depiction of the mechanisms that would be involved in turning this 
giant structure into some sort of a power plant, you, you hear about it, you go, wait a minute, yeah. whoa. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And him and I have very similar theories on how the, the, the power generation occurred. Uh, and I believe that the Nile, you know, would used to run up close to the pyramids and the water would run underneath the pyramid and that would create something called physiostatic electricity as it ran underneath that magnetized crystal granite. Those ions would pour up into the chamber, move up the, the grand gallery where there used to be resonating rods, but you can see the slots where the rods used to be. They're removed now, but the slots are still there. Then it will be pushed into the king's chamber. God, there's some science of the pyramids, isn't it, already? Yeah. Then forced up through the apex, and then the crystal granite obelisk around the region would capture that ambient wireless electricity. And then if you had something called a jet, which looks like a Tesla coil, you can, you can capture that energy. <laughs> Do you want to say something about that? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, El, that's in um, El Mugarad. So the jet pillar was used as like an um, uh, amplifier yeah. to like, raise the blocks, tuning, you would tune in the blocks, the stones, into the jet pillar and then you'd be able to levitate these, these um, granite, granite yeah. stones. The J, they spell what, D-J-E-D-I? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's carry on. Gold electroplating, uh, for any other electrical tools you need, like some of the tools they had to have used to create some of these incredible works of art, you can, we can see the tool marks so we know they had the tools. And, but they had wireless electricity way back then. That's insane. That's, if that's true, that's insane. Because you would think there would be some kind of physical evidence of a device. Like something left over, some sort of a, you know, ancient chainsaw. Right. Like something. Yeah. They did a great job cleaning up. I mean, they poured sand over Giza to bury another couple hundred pyramids there at Giza. Do you think hmm. they poured sand? Do you think that's just natural erosion over time? Because ah, when, when Giza, hmm. when the pyramids existed, it was a very different place, right? Like, if you go back before the pyramids, like 9,000 years ago, it was a lush rainforest, right? Yeah. And then over time, it became sand. And uh, the same with the entire Sahara Desert, mm -hmm. which is really crazy. We just we were talking about the other day, they find whale bones yeah. in the Sahara Desert. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to the Valley of the Whales in a few weeks in Egypt, actually. It's no. You know, it's, it's incredible that there's whale bones out there also. So we're going out there to the, to the Valley of the Whales. Whale bones? Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. But so the, the, the point being that this, this place has changed radically, mm -hmm. like r absolutely radically over time. Yeah. So who knows what's, do you know why those things were covered up? Is it possible that it was just sand over time? Well, if you look at the tablets again, they talk about this war, right? And this war that occurred, there's a lot mm -hmm. of wars, obviously, but this one particular war, it seems like the same one that damaged the area or the region of the Giza Plateau, also Mohenjo-Daro in the Indus Valley up there by Pakistan. And the reason why it's interesting is if you look at the war in the text and then go to those areas, it looks now almost you can begin to see, oh, wait a minute, it looks like war. Mohenjo-Daro, Indus Valley, the buildings turned to glass. Mm -hmm. The sand turned to glass and the bodies are still laying in the street right now today holding hands, never been scavenged by animals. So wait I mean, a minute, where is this? Mohen Jindaro. Are there the, photos that we can look at? Oh yeah, yeah that's that. Mohen Jindaro in this mm. valley, dead bodies still laying in the street thousands of years later. And nobody guess what? Just, they just lay there. No one's covered there. them up. Nobody's no one's covered them up. Yeah, when what? you put a Geiger counter over them, higher than background level radiation. Okay? Really? Yeah. And if but you, aren't stones higher than background level radiation? Some stones are. Some yeah. stones are, especially like diorite and uh, crystal granite. But these bodies, these are just bones. How come they're higher than background level? level no, I can't wait to see this. Yeah. Like, why haven't I ever heard of this? Mohen, Jindaro, M-O-H-E-N, there you go. Whoa. Yeah, this is evidence of a nuclear war or nuclear go type. Go back to the war. other, the one, that one there, that one's insane. Yeah. There's bodies that are sitting on the edge of steps <laughs> next to their own buildings that they lived in. The building is turned to glass. That's 3,000 plus degree temperature weapons fire. So there's a bunch of people that seem to die all at once, just mm -hmm. scattered around? Yeah. And what's the conventional explanation for how these people died? They have no idea. They have zero idea. The only thing that you That can... was just a couple, Jamie. Go to the other, just the Morhen Jandara mythical mass massacre. I'm trying to remember so in the Holy Tablets massacre? when he talks about is the is weapon any, that... Um, the weapon was just laying there. Just laying there. Who was and it that had the weapon? It was the sounds exactly like that. They mm. used that weapon. Right. Let's oh, keep listening. Uh, what kind of, you know, what could have caused that? level of temperature an energetic release well it could have been a low atmosphere asteroid it could have been i mean just been. like that, that, that's possible tunguska 
Yeah, it could have been a lot, but then their bones would have been splattered apart and broken up into pieces. Good call. Yeah, yeah, that's a good call. Yeah, because they because don't seem to be broken apart. No, they're not broken apart. Right. That impact would have shattered the bones and spread them out over a great Right, distance. but without impact, even if you just look at the one that burst in the atmosphere in Tunguska, it just flattened trees. Flattened everything. So the I trees. think it's some insane, like a million yeah. acres or something crazy. Yeah, it's incredible. So How big was the, the Tunguska there. explosion? That, that one's, yeah, so those bodies would be toast because be the trees were yeah. ripped apart. The buildings would have been flattened. The legs would have flown off. Right. There's no way they would just be laying there like that. Exactly. That's interesting. And they yeah. don't seem to be, like, chopped up. No. Did they have any evidence of stab wounds or anything on them? They don't have any evidence of any injury of any kind of attack or any cutting or, like, swords or anything. They just all got cooked. Right. And then in the tablets it says that the evil wind moved over the land after they released these weapons. And, they, and then Enki goes to his father. I mean, yeah, Enki goes to his father anew and says, hey, um, can you stop the evil wind? Because he had fallen in love with some people, you know, and down there. And he's like, <laughs> the there's nothing he's I can do. He said, get in your sky <laughs> shipping for a boat. That means get the hell out of here. And he said the people's hair was falling out. Their eyes were bleeding. Their nose were bleeding. Their fingernails were curling off. That sounds like radiation sickness. So do you think it's radiation sickness that did this to all these people, or was it an impact that did this to all these people? Nobody, nobody knows. Nobody knows. But, you know. but they're they're not blown apart. Right. They're not blown the apart. It seems like whatever, wherever, whatever struck or whatever energetic weapon it was, it, it could have been not, a, not, might not have been a weapon. Whatever it was, it seems like that shock wave reached them at some point, and whatever was in that wave just killed everybody. That's what it did. Yeah. Mm. And they just don't know what it is. So they, how does a conventional uh, archaeologist describe it? Do they just say it's a massacre? They just call it a, a mythical massacre and they stay mm -hmm. away from it. When you look in the other texts, the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita, you find out about these wars also. They're, right. they're recorded. They have weapons called the Brahma Astra and the mm -hmm. Brahma Honda weapon. And these weapons... That's in the Holy Tablets as well. They describe them as doing, duplicate what you saw there. How do they describe them? They describe them, describe them as weapons that once released can't be revolted or can't be turned back and that they will obliterate any area, any city. Uh, and they say that uh, some of the, one of the weapons can destroy any man on three worlds. It's crazy stuff. And this is where Oppenheimer got his famous quote when he... Oh, the bomb maker, isn't it? Right, right. Now I have That's a good movie on Netflix if you yeah, haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I see that one. Yeah. yeah. What a great quote. Yeah. To say yeah. after you detonate the first nuclear bomb. <laughs> <laughs> what a great quote. Yeah. So... So the idea is that there were beings that were having wars on this planet. Mm -hmm. oh. were they, Conflict you, you of the gods. Were they having yeah. wars with people that were revolting? Or were they having wars with other beings? They were nine. with each other. It goes and into evidence of, this, of these mm. wars can be found in the book of Deuteronomy in the modern day Bible. These gods, and I do mean gods with an S, because everywhere in the Bible where it says God singular, it's actually a mistranslation. The actual, if you backwards uh, look up the translation in Arabic and then down to Aramaic and everything else, you find out it's God's plural. They were fighting each other over resources <laughs> we already said that. <laughs> and people and control of, um, control of the planet. Uh, and so that's why in the book of Deuteronomy, God tells people, go to this city. And it's like a far city where they don't even know that these people exist. They go over there to kill them. He says, kill the women, kill the children and bring the spoils of war back to me. And you see these wars in the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, the Bible, the Sumerian tablets. And these wars are just nonstop, the Indian Vedas. And it's always about attacking another city and uh, even talk about Tro Trojan horse methods to get behind the gates and then to, you know, utilize that to attack and kill and bring back these spoils, mm. which is pretty crazy stuff. It's like they were attacking each other. They had gone awry. They had gone rogue out here on this planet and they began to fight over over people and populations and, and resources and we would hope that we would get past that mm -hmm. but yeah. there's no evidence that we have so far so like <laughs> why do you think that as ai gets implemented yeah. and technology oh, escalates and and all we're going to be able to do in the future in terms of being able to go visit other planets and yeah. duke it out on other planets. Right. Like there was a whole story today about uh, China just landed on the far side of the moon. Mm -hmm. So they landed a probe over there. Yeah, yeah, they did. And this is, you know, there was like China, America, war on the moon. Like right. what if America claims a spot and China land? That's in our doctrine from our long moon base. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. The other side of the moon, the, the brain team and all of that yeah. going over there. Yeah. I think that's in um, Mission Earth. Mission Earth, yeah. Man from Planet, Man from Planet, Planet Risk. Risk again, the most named <laughs> classic <laughs> book everyone keeps talking about. It. But yeah, moon-based 
and the Majestic 12 and all that, yeah. Mm. Playing some flag there, and they're like, hey, fuck you, that's ours. <laughs> now that's what's gonna happen. Especially if there's like something on the moon they can mine that's very valuable. Oh, this stuff up there. I yeah. researched the Clementine mission years ago. Uh, NASA and the United States military sent a military, at that time, it was a top secret mission called Clementine. It was a low lunar orbiting satellite to go to the dark side of the moon. And when I saw the name Clementine, I knew right away, this thing ain't coming back. And as I began to dig deeper into the declassified documents, of course, it never came back. Oh, my, dar it's, oh, oh right. my darling Clementine, you were, you were lost, lost and gone, gone forever. forever. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I was right. And sure enough, it hit something on the dark side of the moon, which is really just the backside. It's not really dark there, but it hit something. And But it sent, it back, sent back about 20 gigs of data. And these images are available to the general public. They've been declassified. And there are strange... Isn't that, that's... Um... Image. This is pre-Photoshop. Pre What's it called? Um... Things that shouldn't be there that look like broken structures. Mm -hmm and junk no. and things yeah, that just remember. seem to be laying around. Um, so I think it was a recognizance mission to gather intel and data, which is probably why China's gone to the to that far side of the moon as well, because they're probably going to, it's a race to see who can grab, capture ancient technology and then reverse engineer it and then weaponize it. Mm. Well, that's the most fun theory ever. <laughs> the most fun theory ever is that there's bases on the moon, on the dark side of the moon that aliens have abandoned. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie, are there any photos of these anomalies? That's the most fun. I can, bri I can provide you some with links to the sources, too. Okay. Yeah. That'd be cool. But Jamie will probably find something. Cool. Um, so what do these structures look like to you when you look at them? Just dome structures there. A one dome? The, just domes. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the astronauts... Yeah, Sedonia, isn't it? Remember, this is in the book. I'm trying to... Yeah, it's a long time ago, but... The Information Act documents... Yeah, that, Sedonia. Uh, the, uh, the black box audio and the black box redacted text statement from NASA, which is available to the general public, Neil says, look at those convex structures down there. I bet the people in there never get out. And he's talking about dome structures on the moon. Extraterrestrial and creation. Yeah, extraterrestrial and creation goes into that. I can provide you to link to that as well. Okay, so what are these structures? Do you see any of these that you find? You need to look for uh, anomalies on the back side of the moon. Um, we, can't, we, have, we utilize a lot of these on our Facebook groups. Because uh, remember, in our doctrine, it explains about, you know, the story of Alalu... And and, and the uh, yeah, Leilu and the throne yeah. talks about obviously when he was escaping, mm. um, he actually did projects in, on Mars yeah, and yeah. the moon. And even when they were mining the gold and transporting it, they were taking it to the moon and then to to the to yeah. the craft. So the cylindrical crafts, yeah, the yeah. Cyl cylindrical crafts. And um, mm. the master explained this years ago, and that side was called Sidonia. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. Let's keep going. Facebook, we have these groups, anomaly hunting groups. We formed the United Family of Anomaly Hunters, and we've cataloged about 60,000 anomalies now. A lot of them are, uh, are on the dark side of the moon. Uh, but tell you, type in Clementine Moon Photos Anomaly. You may be able to find some. If not, I'll send you the link to some resources where you can look them up, and uh, you can take a look at some of these crazy objects that are there. So is that one right there in the upper right-hand corner? Yeah, that one's there. There's some structure. Those kind of look like two pyramids onto the left of it. And then another structure, which almost seems like has geometry. And underneath that, you see the blur? That looks like obfuscation. Directly, uh, you know, if you go back which up one? to that top right. Top right? Yeah, top right, B. Okay, you see that where his hand is? I move to the left going down slowly. See that? See, how that, op see that? Go back up again. See that? Oh, where, where his hand is over right now? Mm -hmm. That looks like obfuscation. Sometimes you can take these images and put them into a Photoshop and take away the uh, contrast, and all of a sudden structures pop right out. But yeah, right see the pyramid the one. Mm. Pyramid structures. Right above that. Yeah, you see those pyramids. See that you can see this dark shadow. See this. I see two lines. Okay. The, you, well, I I see the arrow that's pointing to that one straight line, and then I see what looks like two superimposed arrows. Okay. Do you see? Yeah, those things. Okay. Yeah. Those now, are superimposed, right? Like. No, those are shadows. But look, those are the same things that are in the bottom. Aren't right. they just pointing at something? Aren't those pointers? I think they're high, they may be highlighting something. Right, I think it's a yeah. cursor mark or something. So what they're saying, I see what they're pointing to. They're pointing to that thing in the upper right-hand corner. That it kind there? of looks like a pyramid. Yeah, you see that, you see that right there? Yeah. Yeah. It kind of looks like a pyramid. It's cleaned up a little bit there in C. C is more clean. But, you know, those, those, those things don't look like they belong there. Well, it's hard to tell. Yeah, it's hard to tell. Now, we have really, those are mm. Yeah, yeah but you see, there you go. Mm. That's the ones in the books, yeah. yeah. That's definitely was that's like 30, 40 years ago. Um, extraterrestrial and creation. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of hard to think that that was formed by natural. Now, and what what happens is, 
We're not saying we know exactly what these things are. We're Laboratory, we know. We man. know. Yeah, let's just pull that. We know because the master teacher already broke it down. They did a lot of the experiments on the moon and on Mars before they came to the planet and into the laboratories and yep. Shimtu. So yes, we do know um, Moon Base 12, the Majestic um, Brain Team going yep. to the moon, Sidonia, they've, they found this out uh, many, many years ago. So let's keep going. You were just looking at the thing that looked like a pyramid? That one, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, get that one big. Mm. Hmm. You can see the shadows and everything. Mm. That one's very strange looking. Because the way it points at the top and has flat sides, like, yeah. you're like, yeah. That's right. a, if that's real, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh -huh. but it, you know how tall that is? By any chance? That's a good question. There's a, there's a measuring tool. We don't have it, obviously, access to it right here, which gives you an idea of the height. I'd like to see it in real life, though. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes things fuck with you. It's just, but the angle is so unnatural looking. Yeah, it definitely looks unnatural. We just try to catalog things that appear to be anomalies, things that appear to be out of place. Right. It could be anything. And if in the, in the Sumerian tablets, there's this time where Enlil takes his son to the moon, and he says, well, grab your eagle's mask, because you're going to need it. They were referencing that the atmosphere was harsh. Oh, so when you see mask. the when you see the Anunnaki with the eagle's head, that's actually their helmet. It's a helmet. So they can breathe their air. Exactly. <laughs> they talk about it twice. Once to go to the moon and the second time to go to Mars. Yeah, and there's been other we just done it. Oh. of ancient gods and people that look like they're wearing some kind of mask too. Right. Yeah, exactly. Is, yeah. I mean, one of the cooler ones is the, the bubble space head looking guys in the cave. Yes. And you're like, what did you guys see? Right. Like, what did you guys see in the yeah. middle of like hunting gazelles, <laughs> trying to stay alive, trying to make a fire, yeah. and then you decided to draw that thing? Right. What is that? And we know they can draw because they can show you what a gazelle is. They can show you yes. what a cat, what cattle is. They can show you what a person looks yes. like. Yes, yes. But then they draw that, and you have to think, well, why? Right. Why is that the only thing you drew that's fake? Right. Like, exactly. Because it, it looks kind like the waist, and it looks like a dude in a suit with, yeah. the, with a helmet on. <laughs> right. <laughs> How, here's the question: How many different things are visiting us? Mm -hmm. Like, and from how many different places? Oh, a lot. If we, yeah. we can't just think everything's going to look exactly the same. That seems just as silly mm -hmm. as thinking that all of our animals should look exactly the same. Correct. I think we have three different levels of visitation going on simultaneously. One is corporeal beings in a physical body, most likely anatomically similar to us, you know, a, a bilateral bipedal organism with two forward facing eyes, maybe. Do you think two sets it's of what we eventually become? It's that part, what they are? It's possible that maybe we already are them. Just, uh, um, you know, Earth could be an abandoned seed colony. We, uh, every culture that I've talked to indigenously around the planet all say they were seeded on this planet by Pleiadians or other beings, star brothers in various different places. So like the Dogons. Like the Dogons, the Nomo, the Hopi, and the Lakota tribe, the star brothers. The aboriginal elders say that they were seeded here by Pleiadians. All of a sudden, why is everybody having the same story? The Africans by the Nateru, yeah, like, yeah, trying yeah. to leave that one out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe we're even from Earth, to be quite honest with you. Our psychotic rhythm doesn't even match Earth's uh, rotation on its axis. We're slightly off. It's actually better tuned to Mars' orbit on its uh, uh, rotation on its own axis. Than what do you mean? Earth. How's that work? The psychotic rhythm of a human body, the wake and sleep cycle, is actually more tuned to, to Mars. Uh, yeah, the master said that as well. Day were, Day. Yeah, the master he said that they were created on Mars and then brought, brought here. here. That's why the, the, the yeah, that's <laughs> right. We know this already. It's just pretty weird that we don't we aren't synced to our own planet after all these thousands, is maybe hundreds the of thousands of years. Circadian, circadian rhythm, right? Uh, so when, how do they calculate it's more tuned to Mars? Like how does that work? Well, it's just they they geneticists and and scientists discovered that. Our day, our, our perfect uh, wake and sleep cycle is more tuned to Mars rotation on its axis, which is about 23 and, and, and something minute hours, and versus Earth being 24 hours. And mm -hmm. so they said, wow, this is incredible. And the more they tested it, the more they studied it, they realized we're more tuned to, to the Mars. Than this we, though, I have to, mm -hmm. I have to mm -hmm. always have to emphasize we're not all the same. Right. <laughs> what kind of whack calendar do you have? 
where it was makeup stuff. If some uh, some years the month is longer, what right. the fuck are you doing? Like, I know. For make what? a better calendar. Isn't there a better calendar? Yeah. Shouldn't there be like a digital calendar that represents exactly what's going on and not go January? <laughs> Come on, <laughs> fuck out of here. That's, <laughs> pretty, that's, pretty bizarre. that's you know, why we got we've something. got our own calendar as sure. well, and we've had it because we view time completely different. Our calendar has nineteen days, days in a month. Yep. 19 months. There you go. Let's keep going. Could be aliens. Well, actually, every person on this planet is an alien. Even our planet itself is an alien. Scientists just discovered something interesting. I've never talked about this shit on the podcast, so you guys can look this up. So, our Milky Way galaxy is pretty interesting because it's absorbing another galaxy at this exact moment called the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. Not the Sagittarius Constellation. That's something totally different. We are ex absorbing the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy at this exact moment. People thought for all these decades, looking or even hundreds of years, looking up in the night sky, seeing that swath of stars going across, oh, that's the Milky Way. Guess what? We've been wrong the whole time. This is now being taught in universities in astrophysics. So what you're looking at, you're looking at the absorption or the, uh, the merging of the Sagittarius with the Milky Way galaxy. And the exact point where it merges and drops into the Milky Way is right where our solar system is located which would explain the rogue planets that we know that are out there. There's millions of rogue planets that have no sun that are just floating free around. There's planets and solar systems that are orbiting far beyond the orbit of Pluto in our inner Oort cloud, admitted by, ast uh, by astronomers now, that there's other solar systems within this inner Oort cloud area orbiting our sun every 4,200 years. So all of a sudden, uh, that's Corey Powell, the astronomer uh, at Discovery Magazine, by the way, who said that. So this is pretty interesting. We're talking about the fact that our solar system itself is an implant into the Milky Way that we come from Sagittarius. We're not even part of the Milky Way galaxy. Well, okay. So when they're looking at our own solar system, mm -hmm. they have uh, an understanding that there's a thing called the Kuiper Belt that's out there, mm -hmm. and there's so many objects in there that are small, yeah. and that's one of the reasons why they decided to declassify Pluto as a planet, because mm -hmm. there's other objects that look real similar in yeah, size. Monty, Monty and all those other planets. But they think there's something large out there. Mm -hmm. They think there's something large out there that they haven't yet identified because of the way the, the, that gravity is responding. Like, what, what, what is the reason for it? Well, what happens is they discovered that in some way, millions of years ago, something moved through our solar system and captured its own weird orbit around our sun. And what's crazy is the evidence is in our solar system. So Saturn and Neptune switched locations because of a gravitational field. Uranus has flipped on its side and orbits. Its, its, its equator is orbiting north and south, not east and west. And they know that lucky got hit. Lucky got hit, or something gravitationally just tugged at it so hard that it flipped sideways. It never stops. Right? Never stop. And it moved through our solar system way out beyond the orbit of Pluto, and this thing captured its own orbit. This is in the Enuma Elysian, the seven types of creation. This exact process that's been described now by astrophysicists and astronomers is in ancient text that we can read and we can see, oh my God, this is exactly what this text is saying. It's talking about the creation of our solar system. It even talks about the creation of Earth in that text. So it says that when Marduk, a.k.a. Nibiru, a moon of Nibiru, crashed into Tiamat, it broke into pieces and became the hammered bracelet. That's the asteroid belt. <laughs> One giant chunk swung away, recoalesced with, the, with everything, water, land, and organic material needed for life, and became the Earth, tugging with it the moon. So it's pretty crazy that the creation of this planet itself, and it says that it pushed, the net force pushed, Mercury closer to the sun and pushed Venus closer to the sun and then we took the third spot in place uh, around our orbit around our sun and then uh, of course we have Mars which used to be a moon a habitable moon of Tiamat a planet that was four to six times larger than it's all in the holy and tablets yep. all in our Mars books weird orbit and you have to you have to uh, there, uh, uh, Musa is going to an extraterrestrial yeah. with Mars every two years when it's in apogee or perigee, you have to, with apogee or perigee, one of them is further away than the other. One is 80 million miles and the other one's closer. So if you run the rendezvous every two years, you can capture the orbit of Mars and you can actually get there in four months. And then they looked at it and said, wow, they meaning astrophysicists, this looks like this Mars wasn't originally in this type of orbit. It must have been orbiting something else in our solar system, which it was. One side is charred black and the other side is smooth. So the side where Tiamat exploded, 
Those chunks hit Mars on one side, created a very charged side, and the other side is the smoothest surface in the uh, solar system, which is because of the global flood that that created. And then Mars's axis on its equator is tilted 45 degrees on its axis, which means the, the mass shifted it down 45 degrees. They had a major global catastrophe there on, that, on Mars. Uh, and then after Mars, you have another little planet that survived called Ceres, C-E-R-E-S, which is also a result of this Tiamat exploding. People don't even talk about Ceres. It has the most fresh water of any other planet in our solar system. More, more and fresh where water. Is, where's its location? That's the next planet after Mars, Ceres. Really? C-E-R-E-S. How big is it? Is it's, it like uh, Pluto size? it's about maybe two-thirds smaller than Mars. And guess what? It's a what? dwarf planet. So they don't... It's, follows an orbit between yeah. Mars and Jupiter That's near right. the middle of the asteroid belt with an orbital period. Click on that, Jane. When they flew by it, about... You heard about this before? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know there was another planet out there. Listen, when they flew by... He it, cracks it, me up. Like, <laughs> like look how many what? planets are out there. And so they start trying to say it was ice particles glistening in the sunlight. So when they got to the dark side, guess what? The lights were on on the dark side. So they couldn't use the ice particle explanation anymore. So they just said, we don't know what it is. What? <laughs> Ceres' small size means that even at its brightest, it's too dim to be seen by the naked eye, except under extremely dark skies. Its apparent magnitude ranges from 6.7 to 9.3, peaking in opposition when it's closest to Earth. Once every 15 to 16 <laughs> months, and how do you say that word? Synodic? Synodic? I don't know where you're at now. Uh, 16th month, synodic period. You know oh, yeah, synodic. Synodic yeah. period. As a result, synodic. 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 As a result, its surface features are barely visible even with the most powerful telescopes and little was known about it until the robotic NASA spacecraft Dawn approached Ceres for its orbital mission in 2015. And we have high resolution images of the surface. There are strange things there as well, which is pretty crazy, so. What are the uh, images of the surface? Uh, you have to go to nasa.gov and go to the uh, Dawn images and you can download, or, or sometimes the European Space Agency has them as well, uh, ES. And then you can uh, grab those images. It's pretty crazy. Some things just don't look right there. But like there's what, a lot. Of, what doesn't look right? Well, you know, if you look at Mohenjo-Daro or areas of Egypt, that's you know, or even uh, you know, Iraq, where it used to be Samaria, structures that used to be there that are now worn down and weathered, they have similar looks there. Some of the things that they look similar there. Not that's not not saying that they are. I'm just saying that they look strange. Some things well, look strange. We have strange. a lot of strange things on Earth that yeah, are natural. That's true. We we sure do. That's, we even have octagons and straight lines on Earth that are natural as well. That that was one of yeah. the craziest ones that Terrence brought up was the octagon on Saturn. Yeah. Was it Saturn? It's Saturn. Yeah, Saturn. Saturn. That when you look at the oct octagon side of the, it, it's mimicked in the model that they right. created by yeah. using a, a, the whole idea that he really blew my mind with was the Goldilocks zone idea mm -hmm. that planets reach a certain distance from the sun and that's when life starts happening and this is a normal force that happens everywhere in the universe and mm -hmm. as time goes on that planet's going to get further and further from the sun yeah. and then it's going to lose its ability to do that and then a new planet will move into the Goldilocks zone right. and that is also going to become like us mm -hmm. and then so if you are following this idea if this idea makes sense it means that this is just this sort of natural process that these intelligent creatures go through. And even though we're looking at like AI and we're looking at technology it's like, oh my God, we can't even be people anymore. Yeah. Well, guess what? We can't be people anymore right. because we're not going to make it if right. we don't. Like, yeah. if there's, there's a time, it seems like you're only going to live a hundred years, so it's no big deal. But humans, if we keep going like mm -hmm. a few million years, we're going to have a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. A billion years from now, we're not going to be around anymore. No. And then there's going to come a time where the sun doesn't exist anymore. Exactly. So if you get so intelligent that you can escape the boundaries of the physical world mm -hmm. and you can move throughout the cosmos wherever you want, yeah. then you've escaped. Right. You've escaped this fear. But it's almost like there's an intelligent test. Yeah. An intelligence mm -hmm. test that life there you goes go. through. Mm -hmm. Like, we're going to give you all the tools just like you're in the womb. You're in the womb of Mother Earth. We're going to give you all the tools, but you got to get out of the house. Yeah. At a certain point in time, gotta get yeah, out of the house. Huh. You're 24, you're still living at home? Get the fuck <laughs> out of the house. <laughs> They're waiting for us to grow up. Yeah. Uh. That's what, you know, a hum, human, human beings are like babies right now. It's a civilization trying to learn how to walk. And right now we're barely crawling. And then we plop down on our stomach and everybody screams and cries. But we're getting to the point eventually where we'll go to the edge of a table and pull ourselves up. And then we'll take a couple of steps and then we'll fall again. Everybody will think it's all over. Oh my God, we were doing so good and it collapsed again. But no, that's just a fall. 
the baby will pull itself back up, it'll cry less, and it'll take more steps until it falls again, until it can get this controlled fall. And that's the definition of walking, controlling your fall. So we're in that process now. Like you said, this is a proving ground for us to be able to develop consciously, spiritually, ascend to higher levels. Uh, and eventually, I believe, I'm pretty optimistic for mankind that we will get through uh, this period. Well, that's a beautiful thing to hear. I love when people are optimistic because I'm always like, I don't know which one I am. <laughs> I, I tend to be optimistic. Well, you know, it proves what these ancient beings were doing. They were creating breakaway civilizations throughout the entire Milky Way galaxy because of what you just said. Mm -hmm. The fact that, uh, you know, planets won't be habitable forever. Even Earth, let's say Earth never moved and stayed right where it's at in the Goldilocks zone. We're going to lose our control over the weather because the, the moon is moving away at a few centimeters every single year. And as the moon backs off of Earth, our weather patterns are going to get more hectic and chaotic and the wobble is going to be uncontrollable to the point where life won't be able to exist. Not our kind of life won't be able to exist on this planet. So just losing the moon alone in a few million years is going to destroy us. So we have to create breakaway civilizations. We have to get out of here, which is what all these other advanced civilizations in, the, in these ancient texts have done. Well, it only makes sense if, if Terence is correct about this idea of the Goldilocks zone. It only makes sense. And if there are other planets somewhere in another galaxy or ours that have the same exact sort of features, mm -hmm. water, the same temperature, yeah. the same mixture of amino acids and whatever the hell else is here that makes life, yeah. and then it happens there too, it just makes sense that some places are going to be more stable, yeah. so they're going to have less natural disasters, so like people will evolve faster and longer, they'll, they'll exist longer. But then, you know, there's the argument that the natural disasters are actually good because the natural disasters knock us back down. Mm -hmm. If we're about to destroy everything, yeah. knock us back down to some much more primitive version of ourselves, and then we have to rebuild society again yeah. over thousands of years, which that's, that's to the exactly, universe is the yeah. blink of an eye. That's the blink of an eye. You're right. That's exactly what happened in the Emerald Tablets. You know, 36,000 years ago, though, this, uh, he arrives uh, in this place called the land of Kem, ancient Kem, before it was known as Egypt. His father sent them on a mission to rebuild civilization back up to a high level, meaning that it already mm. was at a high level prior to this flood situation. And he says he gets into the great ship of the master and he takes off into the sky until the earth disappears. And then he goes to the point appointed and he sees beneath him the children of the land of Kim. And he descends down. He doesn't sail in. He descends down. And when the ship lands, he opens his doors and he comes out with his crew. And he says the barbarians came at him to attack him with cudgels and spears. And he says, I raised my staff and sent out a ray of vibrations, stopping him still as fragments of stone of the mountain. So he had a stun gun. He had a, a, a weapon that, that was, uh, you know, not root, not, not lethal, non-lethal weapon that can freeze you in your tracks. And we have something just like that now in the military called the active denial system. They can send a beam at a crowd coming to attack and make them stop still right in their tracks. They can make you feel like you're on fire. Right. Make you feel That's like in um, they can even put in year, year 2000 or what to expect. expect. And I think the millennium book as well. Mm, yeah. yeah, yeah, because these are the types of sophisticated weapons that they're using now. So they don't even have to do anything. Riots, they just fire this laser um, that, they, yeah, they that stops you. Extreme, extreme, extreme pain. It's called the active denial system. So he's talking about technology back then that we have right now. Dude, go look, look up that. Cause is that? Do you think that's what that Havana syndrome thing is? It's possible, man. This thing, if this, if you put it above, like in, in the sky, and aim it at an area, and the beam spreads a little bit, you can create mass illness, mass sickness, mass, uh, mass hysteria. You can have everyone running around thinking that they've got somebody the talking heart, the to heart them project. and telling them mm. to do certain things. Mm. It's, 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 it's out about. Control. This weapon can be fully weaponized in a lethal way, in a way that can make people become psychotic. You can make somebody think they're burning it on fire. Whoa. Hmm. Active denial system demo. Can we listen to what this guy's saying? It can deter individuals on a military perimeter all the way up to a riotous crowd. All without permanent harm. <laughs> the only penetration yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those very shallow... It's only the demo, in it? Mm. Uh, and there's no, Whoa. Uh, no permanent injury caused by it. Uh, so what does it do to them? It's on a frequency, a beam of frequency, just like Thoth says in the Animal Tablets. I, write, I put this in my book because it's important. This get volunteer to test out its effectiveness and safety. Wow, he said fuck it. He said fuck it. 
Secretary of the Navy. Most described it as feeling like a hot oven or grill being opened up. See? That would disperse crowd quick. Wow. <laughs> so that's what he used on them thousands of years ago. Holy that's shit. Or something. Something like 2012? it. 2012? Yeah. Oh, now they turned into statues. Oh, yeah. Statues. Absolutely. No. <laughs> now it's over. In Medusa. Yeah. Medusa. Yeah. Holy shit. Same type of technology. What do you Probably think Medusa frequency was? Frequency technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine that. Imagine that story. It, we, we always thought that was just some crazy story. Yeah. But imagine there's a, a technology back then that can actually turn you into stone. Right. Now that we know that people can do things like that, and then we would imagine a thousand years of evolution, 10,000, 500,000, whatever these people are, yeah. whatever these things are that, are that have the ability, it's kind of disappointing that they're still waging war, though. I got to tell you that. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, that's uh, a bummer. That's a real archaic mindset. You know, we have to find a way to rise above. This is why we need to understand exactly what happened and how do we overcome what's been embedded into our epigenetic memories? Because we're oh, suffering from epigenetics. Go into all that. <laughs> psychosis, and this war psychosis. We've been programmed as human beings to, uh, to have consumption and fighting and competition over collaboration. Yeah. Everything is designed to mm -hmm. keep us separate. Divide and conquer is the main mission, and it works so well for so many thousands of years. And this divide and conquer tactic that's been burnt into our DNA and our code has put us in a situation where we are not advancing as we should be. We're getting now this technology leaked out to us. And yes, that's advancing pretty fast, but consciously and spiritually, it's, it's holding us back. But everyone's putting themselves in boxes and saying, I'm a part of this thing and I'm a part of that thing. And then yeah. we don't work together. No, mm -hmm. that's, that's such an important point and it needs to be drilled into people's heads. Yeah. We're distracting ourselves by getting involved in these stupid arguments over stupid things right. when there's really important issues with the world. Mm -hmm. And those aren't being addressed. And the, the, one of the big mm -hmm. ones is, how do you stop people from killing each other? How do you right. stop war? How, how do we stop this insane practice of having groups of people go up against groups of people they've never even met and killing them? Like, exactly. And then we're all okay with this. We talk about how this is normal and this ha has to be done and these war is ugly and it's unfortunate, but we have to do it. Like, okay, are you fucking sure? Who's, who's pulling the strings here? People with $10,000 suits that don't get on the front line. Yeah. They send poor kids and young kids, young men and women to die. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, they exactly. And it's and all about money. It's all about money. And, mm -hmm. you know, Smedley Butler wrote about it in 1933. Wars a racket. Yeah. And That's right. You read that. Read that from 1933, folks. Food supply for the extraterrestrials as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We teach them about the, the food for the gods doctrine. Mm. They don't realize that that's part of the way to cleanse the planet, get rid of the infestation and the wars and religious wars and so on, they're just fighting to depopulate the planet. Yeah, this is a long video, um, very interesting. We've kind of like covered over an hour already and I think we're gonna have to do like a part, part two. two. In it. Yeah, yeah, because we're, we wanna take it in properly. Um, yeah, so look out for part two. But uh, yeah, come down to the store, check out the books. We've mentioned quite a few books, Man for Planet Risk has um, got an extraterrestrial, we can go into uh, intelligent Mission design, Earth. yeah. Extraterrestrial Extra creation. creation. Is God an extraterrestrial? Yeah, these will cover everything that you've heard so far. Cash records. Yeah. All of yeah, just come down to the shop and we'll we'll, we'll give you the, the right tools you need. Yeah, to decipher here. this. Yeah. All right.